So uh, this is uh, Peter Schickluna, uh, who received his PhD from Kiel University in Germany while working on radiative transfer modeling of plumpy and dusty astrophysical environments with uh, Sebastian Wolf. During this time, he was also the recipient of a two-year student fellowship uh, at ESO, where he worked with Ralph Stephen Morgan. Uh, Alfonso Jesus and I met him in Taiwan when he joined Asia A as a uh, postdoc under Siska Kempu. During most of his stay at Asia he was also an Academia Sinica postdoctoral fellow. Uh, since 2018, he has been an ESO postdoctoral fellow. He's currently also affiliated with the Space Science Institute and resides in the US, uh, which means that he will actually be visiting us next month. Uh, Peter works on models and observations of dusty astrophysical environments. A lot of his work is focused on circumstellar dust in evolved stars specifically. He is the PI, or as we like to say, Nest Jesus, of the JCMT Large Program, the Nearby Evolved Star Survey, or NEST. Uh, Alfonso Jesus and I are also members of this survey. Today, he's going to tell us about a machine learning based code for inference of dust properties in various environments. Peter? Okay, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks for giving me the chance to talk to you. Um, so it's, uh, it's very cool to, uh, to, to talk to you all again. I, um, presented Nest you a couple of years ago um, during the pandemic, I think. So it's been a while. Uh, it's good to, to uh, well, not physically come back. I'll visit for the first time soon, but uh, uh, virtually return. Um, OK, so I'd uh, like to start with a quick reminder for everyone of why we should all care about dust. Uh, well, nearly all of us, anyway. Um, so dust is ubiquitous. Um, measurements of the extragalactic background light suggest something like half of all the photons we observe from the universe have at some point in their uh, evolution or their, their travels to us interacted with dust. Um, so that's yeah. most of the information that we can gather about the universe has been filtered through dust somehow. Uh, why, is, why is that important? Well, it means that dust affects basically all of your observations. Um, in many cases, that's because of extinction. Uh, so dust uh, absorbing or scattering uh, the radiation of whatever it is you're interested in, um, if you're not me and therefore not interested in the dust itself. Um, but what that means is that if you want to actually understand your data, you want to remove the dust, you need to understand the dust in order to remove it properly. Um, other reasons why dust is important? Well, it's spectacularly easy to observe. So half the photons that we detect have interacted with dust. Uh, most of those are infrared photons um, that uh, have been photons from stars that have been absorbed, uh, heating up dust and then getting re-emitted at uh, longer wavelengths. Uh, this makes it spectacularly easy to detect, um, which means you can use it to trace a whole load of processes from star and planet formation to mass loss of stars or galaxy evolution and uh, galaxies are detectable in their dust emission out to uh, Z of I don't know what. Uh, he seems to keep getting larger and larger all the time. So it's a, a great tracer of uh, sort of the buildup of metals over cosmic time and uh, various processes are associated with that. Finally, uh, dust, because it's solid, actually preserves some record of everything that was done to it over time uh, in its composition, in the, the details of the structure of the, the material that it's made of. Um, so by observing dust, you're not just getting a snapshot of the current state as you would with most gas traces. You're actually observing a record of the history of that particle um, and, and it's uh, all the different physical environments that it has been subjected to. So you can trace a lot of different things with it. So, okay. How do we go and learn about dust? Um, well, the usual process of learning something about the universe is you go and observe something and you get a model and then you do something with it and you end up writing a paper. And of course, all the action is in step three, um, 
where hopefully you can do something simple, but in general, dusty things are complicated and we have to do complicated things to understand our observations properly and, uh, and learn something from them effectively. Um, for example, uh, we use AGB stars as to, to why things can get complicated and just how complicated they can get. Um, AGB stars are supposedly simple, spherically symmetric things um, where you can uh, apply some simple models and learn a lot, uh, or at least that's what people thought about 15 years ago. And then they started discovering all these weird and wonderful uh, shapes in all of them everywhere. Um, and basically what we've discovered is that there's too much physics in AGB stars. So the observations are too complicated to explain easily. If you want to try and interpret some of these observations properly, what you really need is a model which includes, say, dust and gas and hydrodynamics and chemistry and the stellar pulsations and convection and even stellar revolution. If you're looking on looking uh, at something which you can detect out to very large radii, and then you need to worry about radiative transfer through that envelope and potentially magnetic fields and binary interactions. And in the case of some of these things, they interact with each other. So the presence of a companion can affect the evolution of the star as well as the geometry of the, the envelope. Uh, and then that evolution impact on evolution can have impacts on the dust that you observe uh, and so on and so forth. And so all of these things are interdependent, complex, nonlinear physical processes which makes it difficult to model straightforwardly uh, by separating different things. So if you want to learn something, you want to infer some parameters that matter, you have to actually worry about the distributions, the probability distributions of parameters of the models and even the probability distributions of the models themselves to understand what do we care about? What is important? Which one of these models should we prefer over another? Uh, to actually learn something about the physics that's going on. Um, as a result, because there's so much going on, there's many, many unknowns. And so to attack a single question, you have to be able to integrate over those unknowns uh, and look at the, the sort of things which matter to your question whilst actually propagating the unknowns through the whole problem. And yeah, these, these models can be degenerate. They can interact nonlinearly, or you can just have fairly simple cases where if you want to say, measure the composition of dust, you can have different components with overlapping features. Uh, and hence the, there's some degeneracy between the abundance of the different features uh, and hence the, the, the different uh, the abundances of the different components. And because of all of this, it's uh, extremely important to do things with Bayesian inference, because if you don't, you can end up going down some rabbit hole stuck in some uh, local optimum of your parameter space without realizing that there's a whole world of other possibilities that you need to consider um, because you haven't taken into account the whole distribution uh, of, uh, of different uh, models that you need to consider properly. Uh, so just uh, some, some uh, an example of how uh, Bayesian inference can matter, just a very simple one. Um, so on the left, we have some plots from a, a paper looking at a few different stars, but we're only interested in, in one of them, the one shown with the, the diamonds on the plots. Um, and they took some beautiful Herschel data um, and uh, did a sort of bi-eye analysis, uh, taking some radiative transfer models and seeing what the models would spit out uh, with some reasonable values of the, the parameters that they had. Um, so these are stars where you have sort of the central star, and a mass loss envelope, and then at some large distance you have what we call a detached shell. So you have some enhancement of the, the density um, at that location. And so you see that they have models which are sort of missing large amounts of the emission uh, 
across the range that's relevant for this particular star. Um, and that's because they, uh, they basically took a model with uh, only a few parameters and sort of looked for some, some local minimum by eye, which the human brain is very, very good at uh, finding, you know, finding the right jumps through parameter space to get something that your data, um, but it's very, very bad at doing the global exploration and understanding uh, the, the uncertainties on, uh, on things, what the distribution of parameters could be. Um, whereas on the right, we have uh, so results from a, a different, uh, a different uh, paper, which used the same Herschel data and some extra data uh, for, again, this source where the, the flux is plotted in diamonds. Um, and this is, so this is a completely different way of interpreting the data. It's sort of fitting every point, point by point, um, to see sort of where the material really is rather than taking a parameterized model of it um, and really giving us uncertainties on the mass or in this case surface density um, of the dust throughout the shell. Whereas in this case, they just have some, some value for the dust in some shell uh, at some location. Whereas here we can actually see where the dust is and how much of it is it there is. And, and because in this case, we can actually essentially move dust around to different locations, and, uh, scale the mass up, uh, we can show fairly convincingly that this approach recovers the mass much more effectively. Um, and actually this the previous approach on the left, they found a solution which while it looks very good, um, is actually contains far too much, uh, no, wait, far too little mass um, because it's missing these missing large amounts of dust in these regions where it's uh, missing the emission um, because obviously at large radii to fill in this relatively small amount of emission, you need a lot of material. Um, okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that for studying dust, doing Bayesian inference is important, um, but there's a giant complication, which is that in general, our models are very slow and Bayesian inference is always model dependent. Uh, you're always, uh, or you're usually trying to do a forward inference. Um, so running your model many, many times. Now, classically people do this with some sort of sampler like MCMC approaches. Um, this is great because, uh, it's got an asymptotic guarantee that, you know, after an infinite, num an infinite number of samples, you will converge to sampling from the true distribution that you're really interested in. Um, but that's after infinite time. So you need to execute your model many, many times to start getting to that uh, situation. And the number of times scales pretty badly with the dimensionality of your problem. So if you've got a lot of free parameters to worry about, you're going to be executing the, the model many, many more times uh, than you would uh, than you would with a lower dimensional model. Um, so just to put some some very rough numbers on this of you know best case scenarios, um, let's say that your model runtime is one CPU second. Uh, you typically, even for a simple, well-behaved model in low dimension, will need uh, let's say hundreds of thousands of uh, model evaluations to get a well converged converged MCMC chain, which means you're looking at at least 30 hours uh, for a one second model runtime, um, which doesn't sound too bad, but in reality, you're never going to get away with uh, well, in reality, many of our models take much longer and you often need many more samples, especially if you're in much higher uh, dimensionality, because for modeling an AGB star, for example, you need to worry about doing full radiative transfer. You need a dust model. You might need to compute me theory or something like that. You may need to do hydrodynamics or worry about nuclear synthesis or stellar revolution or all sorts of other things. And 
it's pretty hard to find codes which can do that in less any of those things in less than one CPU second. So the problem is one of waiting if you want to uh, to handle this with MCMC. In reality, many of these problems are simply impossible with uh, standard Bayesian inference approaches because you would be waiting months or years of uh, CPU time to get the answer you're after for a single source. And then you want to do this for some sample, then it becomes even more difficult uh, unless you have enormous, enormous amounts of computing power. So what can you do? Well, obviously you could do something approximate. You could use a faster model. Um, you could do that by ignoring some of the physics. Um, then you have to choose what you're going to ignore. For example, if you're looking at uh, spectra, do you ignore some of the features? Well, then that's going to leave you uh, residuals, which uh, may have some impact on uh, your other param your inference of the other parameters by uh, shifting your continu your the continuum level, for example. Um, you could try interpolating your model. Uh, you know, pre-compute a grid and then interpolate between uh, locations. Well, then you've got a lot of choices about how you're going to do that interpolation, for example. Uh, this is just showing some of those possible choices. Um, and it has other effects. For example, if your model is actually not linear in its parameters, which many physical models are not, then you have some trade-off between uh, generating enough models to sample those nonlinearities properly um, or ignoring them and, and knowing that your model simply can't represent your, uh, your physics properly, uh, your interpolated model that is, or you could try throwing machine learning at it, uh, going to some uh, neural network emulator or something like that. Now that can work extremely well, uh, but it's very difficult to, to evaluate how well it's uh, actually um, interpolating in your model space. So there's, uh, there's quite a bit of risk associated with that. There are other approaches you could use. There's uh, approximate inference approaches, which take many fewer samples. For example, you could just go ahead and only care about your, uh, your best fit solutions, so to speak. Um, but then you don't get in uncertainty information, uh, no credible intervals. And the number for the best fit without the credible interval, without uh, some measure of how spread out the solutions could be, is pretty useless, really. Um, you can't compare it to, to theory without knowing whether your, uh, your theory and your um, predictions, uh, actually, well, not predictions, your, uh, your measurements uh, are consistent with each other. How unlikely is the num are the numbers you found given what, uh, what we think that solution should be. Um, there are approaches out there uh, for inference with uh, slow models, uh, minimizing the number of um, solutions or variational inference takes some approximate posterior and tries to find the best comparison between that uh, approximation and the true posterior with as few samples as you can. Um, but this has some complications. Um, Computationally, you have to be able to evaluate the gradient of your model. So if your model can't be directly differentiated, um, that means you need to do finite differences or something like that. And then your runtime problem just got orders of magnitude worse. Uh, another issue is that this approximate uh, posterior is, uh, we refer to it as mode seeking. So here's an example of how bad it can get if you have a multimodal distribution. Um, it basically picks a mode and zooms in and uh, finds that really well. But if your approximate posterior is near the mode, uh, then it ignores the other, the other solution. Um, there's also uh, a family of approaches called approximate Bayesian inference, uh, which basically avoid evaluating your your likelihood function directly or evaluating your posterior directly and build some approximation to it. And I won't go into the details, but these can be spectacularly powerful in some cases. Um, but they have the issue that uh, they have some extra parameters 
which control basically how well they will estimate your comfort, your credible interval. Um, and it's only when some of those parameters are zero uh, that you get a, a proper estimate. Otherwise, you'll overestimate the, the credible interval all the time. Uh, and getting those parameters to zero is extremely expensive. However, um, there have been some big advances uh, thanks to some machine learning related methods, uh, but which don't rely on emulating your models directly. Uh, they actually uh, basically do inference directly uh, using neural networks. Uh, so these approaches have been dubbed neural inference or, or neural estimation. And it's causing a huge revolution in the simulation-based inference community. Um, it's it's really quite an ingenious approach, actually, uh, and it's yeah, it's really cool. And uh, I wish I could have come up with it, but I didn't. I'm just uh, using something that other extremely smart people have come up with. So the basic idea is that you go and you you have a model which can uh, generate a synthetic observation uh, with noise. So you go and you generate lots and lots of those. Uh, and then you take a type of neural network uh, called a normalizing flow or, or other related uh, networks. And you train that to represent the relationship between your parameters for a model and the distribution of uh, data that those parameters could, could produce. And the reason why they can do that is because normalizing flows are actually probability distributions, uh, and they're um, uh, basically a, a transformation from some probability distribution to some other arbitrary probability distribution. So you can easily uh, understand the relationship between different between the inputs and the outputs uh, when you train one of those on your data. Uh, now, because it's a transformation and critically an invertible transformation, you've trained something which can take parameters and predict the distribution of data sets. So now you can feed it a data set and invert the network and get the distribution of parameters that could have produced that observation. So this approach can be vastly more efficient in terms of, uh, say, number of model evaluations than something like MCMC. But it also has the huge advantage that you never need to evaluate your likelihood function. You only have to be able to go forward and generate an observable. Uh, so in many of the models that we use in, in astronomy, there's stochastic models, which means that their likelihood function is actually poorly defined. This approach has no problem with that, whereas you have to take a lot of extra steps if you're using MCMC to handle that properly. Okay, so I'd like to try and impress upon you how powerful this uh, approach is. So I mentioned it can uh, reduce the number of uh, likelihood or the number of model evaluations by orders of magnitude compared to um, compared to more traditional approaches. Um, another advantage is that every single model run is used at MCMC. You have to randomly generate them. You have to accept some models, reject most of your models. Um, so there's extra overhead there. However, one of the even bigger gains is that inference can be amortized. What does that mean? Uh, it means you invest time once, you uh, generate a whole load of models, you train your, um, your estimator on that whole load of models, but then you can feed it one observation after another, estimating posterior is one after another after another, uh, for basically for free. Um, so this has been applied a couple of times in, in astronomy so far. Uh, a great example is this uh, Hannah Melchior paper from last year. Uh, they took a population of uh, 30,000 galaxies and applied, I think this is the Prospector model or one of those uh, galaxy population synthesis models. Um, and so they could do it by, you know, uh, using MCMC for each galaxy one after another. And that takes about 10 hours per galaxy. So you're looking at uh, 300,000 hours to fit everything. 
but using uh, neural in inference, they took 24 hours to generate their models and train the posterior on, uh, on all of those models. And then it takes one second for every galaxy. So then in 10 hours, if I've done that maths right, um, they've generated all of the posteriors for all of the galaxies. So 24 hours plus 10 hours, uh, that means there's a factor of about 10 to the 4 gain in, uh, in speed compared to trying to do each, uh, each galaxy individually with MCMC. Uh, as I men mentioned, there's also no need to define a likelihood function. So if your model is stochastic, this method has no problems with that. Um, and as a result, it can make inference problems feasible that would otherwise be completely impossible. Um, okay, but sometimes even that is too slow. So sometimes you still have to make extra approximations. And let's say you still need to ignore some physics. Uh, what can you do? Uh, well, you can use uh, something called flexible likelihoods to, uh, to basically fudge uh, your results in a statistically well-motivated way. Um, I won't go into too much detail here because uh, I'm talking a bit slower than I plan to, um, but I'll just say that the, the idea is that you basically have a simple but flexible model for some extra noise on your data. It's your data, not your, your model, but actually extra noise on your data. Um, and you can use this to sort of integrate out uh, problems because basically the, the missing physics will show up as structure in the residuals, and there's absolutely no distinction between structured residuals. Um, okay, so uh, now I'm gonna mention briefly uh, this toolkit that we've been developing to make it easier for you to apply these techniques. Uh, it's called Ampen. Um, it's an open source package that's online that's uh, written in Python. Uh, it uh, can fit your photometry and spectra simultaneously with a single model. And it can include some of these noise models to uh, minimize biases from uh, missing physics, missing information in your model. Um, and basically the idea is that uh, AMP has a framework that you can just go and use uh, by writing a thin wrapper to your own model uh, to get it into a state that AMP will understand. Uh, you can use uh, neural estimation. Um, it also provides access to some MCMC and nested sampling libraries if you uh, don't mind waiting longer, uh, but want to sort of make sure that uh, your neural estimation is behaving itself properly. Um, so now I'm going to show you a couple of uh, in-progress uh, bits of work that we're doing with Ampere. So to come back to dust and AGB stars again, um, one of the big problems that's been attacked over the years repeatedly uh, to varying degrees of satisfaction is to actually understand properly the composition of dust in AGB stars. Um, people have taken a lot of tilts of this in various different ways, but often it's been using by eye approaches um, or approaches that aren't able to quantify the uncertainty in the results very well. Um, so we're, we're taking another crack at this and uh, you can see a quick uh, preview of this here. Um, to start with, we're still separating the problem and only considering the radiative transfer. So there's a lot of other physics that uh, could be taking place, but uh, we're kind of looking at the, the core bit first. Um, and we're starting with carbon stars because they're a lot simpler. Uh, well, in some ways, we only really need to worry about two major contributions to the dust, the silicon carbide and amorphous carbon, not a whole load of uh, crystalline silicates and all that sort of thing that comes with oxygen rich stars. Uh, but we can't just treat the dust. We have to worry about the stellar parameters too. Uh, things like luminosity, uh, effective temperature, inner radius, and so on. And we need a few extra bits of nuisance parameters to model the data. Now, when we uh, shove this into Ampere, it uh, gives us an answer in about a day without uh, doing 
too much optimization. We're still working on uh, speeding that up a little bit because I don't think that's uh, fast enough. It should be uh, should be able to do it faster. Um, you can't really see the numbers, I think, uh, but uh, you get constraints on the abundances of the species that are just a few percent wide. Um, and for comparison, this takes about a day, but uh, we obviously ran a test run with MCMC first, and that takes many weeks. Uh, I think after a week, the chains had just about started, to, were just about approaching the end of their burn. Um, and uh, yeah, then we knew we needed uh, several more weeks to, uh, to actually finish the run. Um, yes, uh, so we're also looking at uh, dust in other contexts. Um, so there's uh, observations with the uh, JWST of uh, 13 stars uh, complemented by uh, observations with HST. So we get the full sort of UV to mid infrared uh, observations. This is a program called Whiskey being led by Sasha Zegers um, and ESA. Uh, so the idea behind this program is to infer the abundances of all the different components of uh, interstellar dust. Uh, uh, basically, all the questions that we've uh, been trying to answer over the years with ISO and Spitzer and so on. Uh, we think JWST can, can finally do it justice, um, including uh, abundances of ices and carbon species and things like that. Um, but the problem is that uh, the dust is relatively simple, other than the fact that the models take a long time. Uh, but you also need to infer the properties of the star, which, because we're using OB stars as the tracer, uh, sort of the background source for these extinction measurements, um, these stars may have a, a wind um, or uh, emission lines or things like that from uh, circumstellar material. And you need to be able to model all of that simultaneously to be able to understand the dust properly. Uh, so you can see on the, the right a sort of simple initial model for one of the stars in the sample with the pre JWST data. Um, and uh, a different way of representing the same model now on the left. Um, and so you can see how just with this sort of subset of the data, uh, how much variation you can get in uh, in this spectrum. Uh, but you can't really see it very well. Apologies for that. Um, so you can uh, hopefully expect to see some proper results from this uh, preliminary study soon. Um, and uh, another sort of in-progress work that uh, should be published soon is uh, re-evaluating carbonate in circumstellar uh, envelopes. So I have to admit, this is not my uh, usual wheelhouse. So I can only say that the, the motivation for this is that uh, the model, uh, the, or the origins of uh, interplanetary carbonates are pretty fully understood. We uh, find them in meteorites and uh, and in asteroids and interplanetary dust particles and things like that. Uh, but classically, they're supposed to require um, aqueous mixing to, to produce carbonate um, on the surface of a, a planetary body. And we really don't uh, know how they can be produced in space. Um, however, they've been detected in planetary nebulae um, with uh, ISO data. Um, and so we're revisiting those spectra. Um, so there's uh, strong features from some of these uh, things like calcite and dolomite, which Ampere is able to recover pretty well. Um, but uh, what's nice is that uh, doing this analysis sort of more rigorously, we uh, end up with a mass fact, mass masses for those uh, carbonates, which is about 10 times lower than the, the previous analyses. Um, and this is a big improvement uh, because the, the masses were much too high before uh, and uh, you would have required some extra supply of calcium to uh, to produce the calcite signal um, as the previous uh, the previously uh, measured mass. Um, okay, so I'll just uh, wrap up now. Um, 
and uh, thank you again for letting me talk. Uh, so the, I hope I've convinced you that uh, Ampere is potentially a great tool. Uh, it's available. Uh, the paper will be submitted very soon. Uh, if you're interested in it, uh, it's you know, development is ongoing as with most research software and contributions are very welcome. Um, and yeah, I will just stop there. And thank you again for, for uh, inviting me. Back questions to the auditorium. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so you, can you define any structure, any geometry you want in your code? And I'm asking you because this planetary nebula you just described, the butterfly one, has a double toroidal structure. So are you able to reproduce that? So the current model that we're using doesn't take that into account. It's doing everything in the optically thin limit. Um, but there's nothing stopping you from from including that uh, and uh, because it's more of a framework right you can define a model which includes the geometry um and redo the the analysis with that thanks thank you Victor. uh i have a good how uh table is this i mean can i use this can i use your code to simply Fit a uh, spectrum of uh, millimeter emission of dust, or is this uh, very specific for AEB stars and the infrared or and the spectrum? No, so it's very general. Um, you can take any set of photometry or any spectrum, um, and you just have to have to be able to write a model in Python uh, or a wrapper in Python to some model that can produce uh, produce uh, model spectra. So you can adapt it to whatever use case you have in mind, um, whether that's uh, more AGB star things or the, you know, fitting the stellar parameters of stars or exoplanet atmospheres or galaxies. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a case of writing, I don't know, 30 lines of code or something like that to, or whatever your model needs um, to interface it with and add properly. And I guess I have to train the error, right? Once I have decided right. that I have to train it. Right. So, well, so Ampere will do that, basically. You you tell it what your model is like and what, uh, what range of parameter values, it, like what the what the prior volume is, um, an ampere will generate models and it will train the network and then it will do the inference. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Sorry, any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. And my question is about the dust species in the code. I don't know if uh, the code include the dust species of the user must introduce them. What are the... So, Right, so so um, that's kind of up to how you define your model, right? Um, so we've defined models with the species that we expect, but uh, anyone can define a new model to use with Ampere with uh, with whatever species they want, and our models are available, so you can use them as a starting point to figure out how to implement whatever other dust species are are interesting. So, Ulysses, we, we already have a library of optical dots. Right? Uh, uh, in addition, uh, the user is also, if there's a new model that they want to input for optical constraints or something. Uh, and also, because uh, you need to generate a new thing every time you prescribe a dust distribution, grain size distribution. That's what he's saying, he's saying that you can also do that if you pro just provide the information. Okay. Uh, Roberto. Uh, hi, Peter. Roberto. Uh, hi. Uh, so, so when you mentioned this uh, flow, I forgot the words, essentially this transformation between how the data looks like and the model parameters, is that transformation like always linear or well-behaved or, or how do you know that uh, 
the, the machine learning tools of, 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 of your modeling uh, software will uh, correctly, uh, I mean, do you have like metrics to know that, that it will correctly enter the, the model or how is that managed? Right. Um, so basically you're asking how can you tell whether the whether the, the neural posterior is actually a good match to your yes, your yes, data. Yes. Yeah. Um, so obviously it's a neural network, so there's a you know there's training going on and sometimes that training can go wrong. Um, but usually they're flexible and robust enough that doesn't for uh, normalizing flows because it's uh, it's basically chaining up a set of transformations one after another to adjust the shape of this uh, well of a Gaussian distribution um, until it matches the the distribution it's trying to represent. Um, but there are ways that you can measure that. Um, there's two approaches that are needed. Um, one is posterior predictive checks. So you basically generate more models um, and see if the posteriors, uh, how do you put this? See if the models, the, the fluxes or whatever your observable is for those models actually overlaps with the distribution of uh, that you would expect for the values that you that are coming out of the posterior. Um, the other thing is simulation based calibration, which I will not even attempt to describe because I know I can't do that justice in a short time. Um, but there are guides out there. So Ampere is uh, basically interfacing with another code, uh, SBI, which is specialized for doing neural inference. Uh, and the documentation for that package has some great descriptions of how you can apply um, posterior predictive checks and simulation-based calibration to actually see if you're getting a, an effective posterior out of it. Any other questions in the auditorium? Okay, if not, are there any questions on Zoom? Apparently not. Um, I have a last question before we wrap up. Uh, so this was uh, related to Roberto's question. Uh, is it possible to cross-validate, uh, for example, if you have a training? Uh, yeah, is there some sort of cross-validation that you can do with the training data? Um, hmm. at, at what step are you thinking so, of? So, for example, when, when Charlie asked whether you can, you can uh, so you need some time to train the uh, model, and you said, "I'm yeah. okay." Uh, so, when, during the training, it's possible to do some sort of cross validation. Ah, oh, I haven't thought about that. Um, I, hmm. I'll have to think about that. Please ask me again when I when I come to visit. Please, I can't wait that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, if we don't have any other questions, then let us thank our speaker again. Thank you. So, Peter will visit us between the 9th and 13th of June. If you're interested, you can catch up then. Let me know. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, Peter. Thank See you later. Thank you.